Um, the building was built in 1926 and it was started on 10 acres that came out of cornfields and now we have 42 acres of park. The building was built by um, architects who built it in a Gothic collegiate style. They um, built a student union, so multi-use buildings. And that's what this is used after. We have um, apartments, we have um, food, dining area, we have classrooms, and then we also have business offices. Okay, Paula. Hey. <laughs> Confess, Thanks. where are we? I'm lost. We're in the lobby of the Theosophical <laughs> Society's national headquarters. <laughs> My goodness, and someone has to say something about this exquisite painting. It's a mural. It was painted in uh, 1931 on canvas, and then put up his wallpaper. It was painted by an evolutionist, and uh, uh, it depicts evolution, and I'm going to explain it to you. I, I like that. It was painted by an evolutionist, and depicts evolution. In, in a broad sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a picture of me. <laughs> even, even in that state, you see, I was slightly <laughs> contemplative. And you'll notice that you then are one of the forms that was kept by the creation, where these oh. forms were destroyed mm. by the destroyer. So, uh, we have a morning meditation, uh, mostly staff that meets from um, 8.30 to 8.45, kind of just to gather ourselves, get it together, and put a little peace and love in the world. Alrighty. Yeah, and then this, you might um, zoom in on this. This is a painting of Manny Blavatsky, one of the founders, and it was painted by the artist who um, did uh, Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Yeah, this is the 35 Buddhism of purification. And if you're recording, don't be that far away. Okay, I was going, I was trying to get the whole thing okay. in. Yeah, it's the 35 Buddhism of purification. And it's a famous practice piece for all Tibetans. They memorize the text to go with it. And they chant the names of the top of 35 season give up as somebody on the book of the same number. They change your book, right? They're not people that are the top. And so it's the 35 pieces of purification. It's done as part of a. In the olden days, when they did the 100,000 prostrations before practicing Tantra, they would recite that sutra as part of what they call the three the three purifications. Pumposongido, the three mountains, the three mountains of purification. And so what would be, And so then would this a, be a, like a visual inspiration for yeah, that one process? Yeah, visualizes, one visualizes the 35 Buddhas in front. Okay. And uh, more or less how they're put up here in groups of uh, seven fives or 35s and mm -hmm. probably in groups of Very something nice. like that. Uh, w. How popular, common are these kinds of works? I, I hmm? really have no idea how common this kind of painting is. Uh, I mean, because it uh, takes a lot of work to paint 35. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Therefore, it's not so common. Who would own such a thing? Probably a monastery or private practitioner. Mm -hmm. You know, to really say anything about it, I'd have to open it and look at it and feel what kind of canvas was on it. Yeah, they put card before and glass in front, yeah. so it's very hard to say. Right. And, you know, Tonka paintings like this are usually they're, you know, in brocades. I, I, I didn't know it would, would be called a Tonka painting. Yeah, like a yeah. Tonka. Well, I know, usually... Like in the, Tibetan, they just call yeah, it a Tonka. Usually, I, I am aware of the fabric to the Tonkas. Yeah, That's so in olden it's... days there was no glass in Tibet. Okay. And they used, so they just basically, and plus for storage purposes, they'd frame them in cotton or silk brocades, and when they used them for a particular practice, they'd take them out. Otherwise, they'd roll them up. So the great uh, Mongol, the great Italian Tibetologist, 
Tucci wrote a book on these kind of paintings called Tibetan Painted Scrolls. Okay. And so in early yeah. days in Western literature, they were referred to as Tibetan Painted Scrolls. All right. The Tibetan word tanga just means flat things. Really? <laughs> tanga is flat, is flat yeah. <laughs> in other words, two-dimensional, as opposed to a sculptor or a... Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's very interesting. See, I learned a lot right there. That's good. Yeah. And I'm sure if we opened it, and if it were it's an actual painting, then you'd see the, along the ridges, you'd see the sewing marks, the mm -hmm. holes in the canvas. You know, they make a canvas by taking cotton, usually, mm -hmm. and then rubbing a kind of a white pigment on it. Make a canvas in that way. And then, uh, goes to the tailor. Usually the uh, person wanting a painting, you're not allowed in the Buddhist world to make a painting and sell it in public. That's considered very uh, low quality character to do that sort of thing. So someone wants a painting of this nature, they go to the artist and say, I'm going to do the practice of the 35 purifications mm -hmm. for a year. And please paint me a tanka, and I want to use this size, and I want to use this much gold, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I will determine the price mm -hmm. and uh, materials. But the artist is paid for the work. And the artist, or, or just yeah. supplies. Yeah, no, okay. uh, nothing. Is, uh, it's a lifestyle. The art itself is not. But he, the artist wouldn't paint something like this and put it in the market to sell it. Right. It right. would have to be commissioned. Okay. All right, that helps me a lot. I, mm -hmm. I may very well have letters and documents in the archives that explain mm -hmm. where we got this, but I These might not recognize it. has his own name. Okay. So they okay. memorize the names of sure. the 35, and each represents a type of purification. Like all right. Then, um, this is obviously a gift from the Dalai Lama when he visited. It was. It was from 1981. Yeah, he gave me one of these. I put one of those up somewhere. Yeah. What can you tell me about? Where he wrote my old friend Glenn Mullen to my old friend the Glenn. Yeah, it's just a simple it's Buddha, a Buddha Shakyamuni. Yeah. And when Dalai Lama would go on world tours, he'd have his um, artists in Dharamsala paint, paint him a couple of hundred simple tankas like this. Mm -hmm. And the Tibetan tanka painting is done in little teams, like schools. Like he'll be a master artist and he'll take apprentices and it's a seven year study and a five year apprenticeship at the end or internship at the end, it's a 12 year training. And most of those little artist colonies or clusters or clans or whatever you want to call them are, I don't know, anywhere from three to eight or ten artists, a master artist with these students of various levels. Mm -hmm. And so for something like this, They'll probably take a, something like a wax paper with, and they'll make the outline of the main figure and then they'll dust it with blue chalk so they don't have to do everything completely. And then they'll do the main figure just by hand. And then the worst artists will do the background and a little bit better artists will do the animals and a little bit I better see. artists will do the mountains and clouds. I see. And then the best of the students will do the body and the robes. And then the master artist will do the eyes and the hands. All right. And the, the brocade cloth? So traditionally, yeah, this is, is uh, just something that all those people bought, as, you know, made in Varanasi. Right. That's Indian, Indian silk. And what would the inscription be? Well, it's got it in translation. Nicole. I'm too far away from it to read it. Okay. Suffering is to be known and its cause sure. to be abandoned, transcended, and sure. the path, uh, liberation to be understood, and the path to mm -hmm. be cultivated. Total Taurus yeah. junk made in uh, <laughs> Nepal and Kathmandu for. None, place, nonetheless. Place. What? John gave it to us, so we love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the minute he's not lo looking, try to take it out in the backyard and make a bonfire, brother. <laughs> Yeah, they just basically train these street kids how to splash paint a little bit, and yeah. they make mandala-looking things, and they sell them to tourists, and the tourists think, wow, that looks very exotic, very well, esoteric, it it's a mandala. To us it does, yes. But it's not a mandala, you see, because there's no mandala was 
the, that configuration of deities. Every Buddhist mandala is based on a tantra. The tantra is a text taught right. by the Buddha, goes through the lineage. Mm -hmm. It's either correct or it's not correct. If it's not correct, it's junk. Okay. What did it say on the bottom originally, do you think? I have no idea. Can we take a look? We can try. I'm not really that but much of an expert on statues from the Far East. Let's just see, take that off for a moment. But it's a Chinese Buddha, mm -hmm. and I would say uh, the Manchu Mongol, the Manchu Mongols who conquered China in 1644, tried to bring civilization to that barbaric country, mm -hmm. taught them how to make some decent art statues. Before that, under the Mings and so forth, Chinese statues are ugly as hell, mm -hmm. short, dumpy little things. Yeah. And the Manchus, the so-called Qing dynasty, came in and taught them how to make decent statues. There might actually be a label under the under the doily here. Mm -hmm. In some cases, there's no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm not exactly what to say about it, and I heard it's been here a very long time. It is. This kind of tonka is known in Tibetan as a, as a simtong, which means a... Uh, How do you spell that? T-S-I-M. So sim means uh, embroidered. Okay. Uh, by, like that. Okay. And they're very expensive. Don Rubin in New York just bought one for $150,000. The very fine silk thread they use, I can imagine it was a lot yeah, of Yeah, it's a lot of hard work. A lot work. of work. In terms of the actual figure, it seems to me just to be uh, an ordinary uh, Buddha as a bodhisattva, because he's got a begging bowl as opposed to, and okay. most bodhisattvas hold things like uh, you know, jewels or a wish fulfilling jewel, or they hold all kinds of things, but it just seems to have a begging bowl there. But on the other hand, it could be of some form of Avalokiteshvara, Shenrezi, the Buddha of compassion, because it's hard to tell if those, are, I mean, they seem to be. silken bodhisattva robes and he does have some ornaments like he's the ear ornaments but he's you yeah. can't see the wrist ornaments or the ankle ornaments which means bodhisattva okay. so it must be i think something like that like a right. the bodhisattva as a monk okay because he's got a begging bowl of, or as a beggar unless that's supposed to be a wish fulfilling jewel so this is also tibetan yeah, All right. probably Tibeto-Mongol, something like that. There's an area of Tibet called, which really used to be part of Mongolia, called Rebkong, uh, R-E-B-K-O-N-G, quite close to where Tsongkhapa was born. And they used to have a great tradition of art, like along these lines. Mm -hmm. But actually looking closely, this is, this is a, that's it. He's got over here, this is an antelope skin. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that means it's almost definitely Avogadishvara, Buddha of Compassion. Okay. Uh, it's Manali Lavu Spiti in India one time and uh, had it commissioned. Oh, really? I think it was Floyd. One, oh, almost in the TF there. Betty, Betty mentioned it to me. One of the fierce people went to India and someone was making sort of these woven 
Uh, it's just a decorative crown. There's nothing unique. It's just, I mean, it's unique, mm -hmm. but it's nothing metaphorically or symbolically significant. Uh, the, Buddha, the bodhisattvas always wear great crowns. And this could be somehow connected to Buddha's uh, discourse on the perfection of wisdom when he held up a flower and the flower, he was okay. asked for the deepest meaning of life and he held up a flower. Or black. So he had curly, curly, his hair when cut short was curly. Is that, is that one of the 32 marks of the Buddha then? Is that like the physical marks of the hair? I'm not sure I've seen it as one of the 32 marks, no. There is one hair of hair that's 32 mark that if you pull it, you can walk out with it for 100 miles and when you let it go, it goes back in by itself. <laughs> really? Who <laughs> <Stop> that up? <laughs> The more enlightened you are, the more retractable is your penis. I wouldn't want to test that theory. Any <laughs> basant? A lock of Henry Olcott's hair and things like that. Hmm? But I don't think there's anything. Uh, it's not so much art in here. It's just Small little green stone swastika. Is there a Videographer. Hey. How's it going? Good, good. Shouldn't the focus be more on the tanka? I'm getting there. It does, it does. Yeah. You have to tell us, Tim, which of these are yours and which are The only thing that's yes. mine is these things here and that one there. This one? Yeah. And the rest are... We're here already. Okay. This is probably, uh, can't 100% say because there's some damage up here, but you have a, a llama here is holding a dharma wheel. And that means he's either a Dalai Lama or the Bog Lama, the Lama King of Mongolia. And I suspect it's the seventh Dalai Lama. And his Mongolian guru, Chankya Rope Dorji, great, great Mongolian master, or our, our main disciple, not guru, sorry, main Chankya. disciple, Chankya Rope Dorji. If it's not his disciple, Chankya Rope Dorji, it's his teacher, another uh, Mongolian lama from Rebkong, where I think your piece upstairs is from, you know, okay. in the meditation room. And that Lama's name was uh, Naung Chokten. He became the first Retting Rinpoche. Amitabha. And on the bottom, peaceful and wrathful aspects of Paladin Lama. Okay, that peaceful. peaceful and wrathful aspects of Paladin Lama. So the Oracle Lake goddess. So when you go to the Oracle Lake, sometimes at night, you hear the pitter-patter of mule hoofs in the sky above. That's Peldon Lama. That's Peldon uh, Lama's mule kicking up dust in the clouds above. And it's in peaceful form, then it's a wealth deity in this white form. But I can't be sure of the three lamas on top. Firstly, there's, you know, they're identified by things here and here and here, but 
as you can see, those have been damaged and the paint has come off. So that's really the identification. But I would say it's probably Sankapa, probably the seventh Dalai Lama, and either the seventh Dalai Lama's main Mongolian guru or his main Mongolian st student. Either his so guru, either his guru Ngaung Choden, okay. or his student Chankya. What does it say on the back? Can you read that? For the TS in America, Wheaton, Illinois, Marion Westergaard. Mm -hmm. Do you know Marion Westergaard? No, I, I did not. Yeah, it's but, hard to know, say. Anytime we have a name or a thing associated with it, yeah. I may be able to find correspondence related mm -hmm. to it. I mean, Tibetans aren't big on Buddhas made out of wood. Mm -hmm. It's much more uh, Nepali tradition. So this is very possibly, and the Noir Buddhists taught the Tibetans how to make, the Noir Buddhists of Nepal taught Tibetans how to make statues. Okay. So it's very difficult to tell the difference between, in, from purely from the style, between the great statues of Nepal and those of, say, Tashi Lumpo in Tibet. Okay. So, this is a very wonderful piece and very well made. Mm -hmm. That one looks like one of those ones from Kathmandu, that area. Which one? The one you're holding. Well, what is the name of that area where they do all the uh, Patan, Lalitpur. But no, this is a Chinese Buddha. I would think. It's a very large head. Uh, and the craftsmanship in it, on it isn't so good. Is on the other piece. But I'm not an expert on the Chinese. It's probably made for a conference somewhere like Japan or Thailand or India where they like to take a famous one, but when they remake it, they kind of modernize it a little bit. Yes, and an old, very beautiful wooden Chinese Buddha. Mm -hmm. You know, and these, I think you have to take good care of them from the point of view of oiling occasionally, or they'll crack, the wood does crack. Okay. Talk to Ben about that. We should talk to Ben about that. Being a woodworker, help us. Of work. Being a woodworker and a Buddhist, you'd help us find the right oil. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, I don't know much what to say about that one. It seems like it's probably... I would think it's made in Nepal, but I could be wrong. It doesn't have any clearly defining features. But the hand is down again. Well, this is a standard calling the earth as witness and the other hand in meditation. So that's one of the five standard Buddhas that you are very popular in Nepal and India. Otherwise, it could just be a Shakyamuni modern piece made in India, you know, copied from a Nepali or Tibetan piece. That's quite popular down in the south, you know, in the, okay. the popularity of the Buddha in the last in the last hundred years of India, the Buddhism sort of made a comeback, or Buddha as a great Indian made a comeback mm -hmm. as kind of a nationalist or something like that, sure. and uh, as a sort of a figure of India's former greatness, mm -hmm. something like that. But the metal isn't something commonly used in India, which is makes me think there's more probably that it's made in Nepal and the inlay work also is, uh, I can't see the Indians doing that. So I would settle on saying it's 75% probable that it's a Noir piece made in Lalitpur in Bhutan. 
but not 100% sure because, you know, Don Rubin in New York doesn't like to buy metal pieces because it's so hard to tell anything about metal because mm -hmm. the metal doesn't change. So if you buy paint, paint changes every 25, 30 years mm -hmm. and the fabric around it changes every 25 years. You can carbon date it and stuff like that. But I think it's one of the longer sets of the lives of the Buddha in 108 paintings. Very popular theme. Uh, the main reason I think is life of Buddha, because otherwise any Buddha looks like any other Buddha if stylized enough. But over here you've got the contest of the arrows going through six trees. Sure. And that's kind of like a unique thing. Not anyone can put an arrow through six trees. Mm -hmm. And in the archery contest, that's how he won his third and favorite wife. Mm -hmm. And none of the other stories are obviously stories from the life of the Buddha. So, But there's little texts in Tibetan which describe each vignette on these, you know, made by the, by the first master artist who made the first set. Mm -hmm. And then he'll talk about, so then the school will become famous for it. And, Someone will see it and say, hey, I love that set of 108 paintings. Could your school make one for me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they'll all be quite different than one another because, you know, the, over the different schools making them and their own ideas and interpretations and pigments and stuff like that mm -hmm. make them stylistically very different. Yeah. 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 Maitreya, by the way, is my Buddhist name. Do you see the likeness? <laughs> yeah, they dropped him on his head when he was a kid. He hasn't fully grown out yet. Yeah, they dropped him on his head when he was a kid. He's got a bump on his head. <laughs> What's the name of that? Yushnisha. Yushnisha. Sugtor in Tibetan. Ball of light that pushes the head up. But if you try to see the top of it, you can't. And you look up, and it goes up higher. You look up, and it goes up higher. And it goes all the way to the top of the universe. But if you look like this, it looks like it comes like very short. Mm -hmm. Like you have the impression that you're not looking at it this short, but if you look up to look at it, it cuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Holly Grant. Reception. Where are we? I'm lost. We're at the Theosophical Society <laughs> in Wheaton, Illinois. We welcome you and we look forward to your lecture. And are you delighted that Mitt Romney won the Illinois primary? Um, actually, I voted on the other side. So. <laughs> you voted for Rick Santorum? No, not that side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello from the Theosophical Society of America, based in Chicago, the suburb of Wheaton, Illinois, where only yesterday Mitt Romney emerged as the triumphant hero of the Republican Party. Ah, oh, that's very philosophical. Everybody will be very interested in that part. And Michelle will show you the great wonders of this magnificent oasis in the middle of the steps of the mid-America, wow. the heartlands of America. I don't know if I can be that poetic, <laughs> but I'll give you a tour.